Okay, well, let's turn again in our Bibles to uh, chapter 11 of Daniel, the great chapter. Uh, the song we just sang, number 37, you'll notice the uh, third and fourth stanzas, the themes of them. And when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die. And then the fourth stanza, when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation. And so these are the two themes in the Bible. Uh, 1 Peter uh, 1 verse 11, the sufferings of Christ, the glory that should follow it's the theme throughout the Bible that Christ will come and he will come to die. He will come to rule and reign. The great theme, the great theme. I have uh, one book on my library uh, by A.M. Hodgkins called Christ in All the Scriptures. And uh, I just, it's a great book, an old book. You can find it. Uh, get it, and uh, it uh, just presents that theme. The Bible also tells us, though, that Christ will come, and the Bible tells us that Antichrist will come. And nowhere more so than in the book of Daniel. As a matter of fact, the book of Daniel almost tells us that Antichrist is coming, perhaps as much, if not more, than it tells us that Christ is coming. And the world at large will reject Christ and receive Antichrist. And that's the way the poor, fallen human heart works. Uh, I'm come in my Father's name, and you receive me not if another will come in his own name. Him ye will receive. And so we've got now before us the, the willful king, uh, would somebody like to read, though, verses 35 uh, to 40? Uh, Daniel 11, verses 35 to 40. And some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, and to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time appointed. And the king shall do according to his will. He shall exalt himself, and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished. For that that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god. For he shall magnify himself above all. But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his fathers knew not shall he honor with gold and silver, and with precious stones and pleasant things. Thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. All right. Thank you very much. Let's bow for prayer. Our Father, again tonight, we're thankful that Thou hast given us uh, Thy sure word about the future. We're thankful that it tells us about the past. We're thankful that it tells us about the old rugged cross and the finished work there. We're thankful that it tells us about the present, that Thou art our great high priest. But we're thankful, too, that it tells us that Thou art soon to return. And yet, Lord, we know also it tells us about the coming Antichrist. And so, Father, do bless tonight, and that is the theme, and we are the messenger of that theme as we come to it in this portion of thy word. Do be with us, we pray. Uh, bless our people. Be with uh, many traveling at this time and uh, some considerable distances. 
pray for them. We do pray tonight for Ingber's uh, neighbor and that you'll undertake for her. In Jesus' dear name, amen. We will not see the Antichrist. We will not, possibly not even suspect who the Antichrist might be. Uh, we might think there's, boy, this fellow looks kind of like him. I don't know that we'll have an inkling of it before the rapture. Uh, the Bible, one of the key passages on that is 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 7. He that now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. So the spirit indwelt church that lets, that hinders, uh, the manifestation of sin, the salt, the light is taken out. And according to Second Thessalonians 2 verse 7, then shall that wicked one be revealed. So that's a pretty good, clear intimation that we will not have too much of an idea, but we will certainly, we see the uh, events of the tribulation, they are kind of looming up ahead, and we know that there's going to be a man who uh, involves himself in this. So we got that, and uh, we have here this long chapter. Uh, it's probably uh, in these days one of the least preached chapters in the entire Bible, and you can understand why. It is not an easy chapter. Uh, it's a chapter that is intricate. It's a chapter of 135 prophecies uh, uh, that were fulfilled in the past up to the, uh, you might call them the first Antichrist, Antiochus Epiphanes, 135 prophecies. Daniel saw 100, 135 things, how that Alexander would die, uh, he would, his kingdom would be divided, and particularly between the Seleucids, uh, Syrians in the north, and the Potomies, the Egyptians in the south, king of the north, king of the south, they would go back and forth, back and forth. Poor little Israel was um, between the upper and the lower millstone ground, practically to powder, as they would go back and forth against each other. Daniel saw it. Amazing prophecies. And then it takes us right to this vile man, this terrible king, Antiochus Epiphanes. And then in verse 35, as we saw last week, it, there's a bridge across the ages, uh, 21 centuries now. And it takes us to the end of the days. And you, you have expressions to that. Uh, even to the time of the end, at the end of verse 35, uh, for it is yet for a time appointed. And then it introduces us to a willful king, a willful king. And this willful king is the Antichrist. Now, among students of the word of, uh, of prophetic scriptures, there's a, a clear dividing line as to this willful king's identity with regard to the king of the north. In, in, up until now, you've had the king of the north, king of the south, fighting against each other. We just left the king of the north. We just left Antiochus Epiphanes. Terrible man. Terrible man. Uh, destroyed Jerusalem. Slew 80,000 Jewish people. Desecrated the temple. Uh, so much so that the Bible calls it an abomination of desolation. Uh, but it was not that final abomination of desolation. Then immediately it goes from him to this willful king. And many have thought, well, that must be that this willful king is also the king of the north. Because there's a latter day king of the north. For example, in verse 40. But it's not. But many uh, good Bible teachers believe it is. Many even say the final king of the north is the Antichrist and 
the final king of the north is a lineal descendant of Antiochus Epiphanes? Don't think so. Don't think so. Uh, one of the key passages, if you will look at verse 40, on your, you can look at in your Bible. By the way, as I said a couple of times in the past, when I give the notes out, you don't have to read them while I'm looking at. Uh, you can look at me. You can look at your notes. You can look at your Bible. Uh, don't look too many other places, but uh, th th those are kind of your choices. If the notes are, a, a, you know, a distraction, uh, they're, they're your reference to take home and to study over a period of time. You're not going to be tested on them. If we were having a Bible Institute here, that would be grand, but we are not. This is a, an evening service or Thursday evening service, but make, you've got them for reference. Take them home, study them. But uh, you'll notice verse 40, verse 40. And here we've got clearly three personages. And it says, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. Who is him? Him is verse 36. A king shall do according to his will. And you've got these pronouns. By the way, our door shut back there. We maybe should prop it open. I can feel the... Uh, and we'll just get that flow of air going through here tonight. I notice the fans have come out, and that's a sign that... Uh, so you've got this, these pronouns, and they all refer to this willful king. And uh, then we come to the him, and the pronouns are important throughout this. And actually in your notes tonight and the next couple of weeks, the notes will... Uh, Put the pronouns in red so you connect all the pronouns and you will find they all refer to the willful king. And uh, so here, looking at verse 40, And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him. At who? The willful king. And the king of the north shall come against him. First time the king of the north has been mentioned. Shall come against him. This is a latter day king of the north. Almost certainly it's Russia. Uh, like a whirlwind and with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he, now he, uh, as we would read on, can only refer to the willful king. Some say he is referring to the king of the north. And that's a debate amongst Bible students. Uh, I'm convinced that he, if you were to read on and look at all the pronouns, you'll find that all the pronouns refer to that. Some say there's a transfer here. Don't think so. Some say that uh, that is. But I think all of the pronouns here refer to the willful king, the Antichrist. And by the way, they say, well, you got three. That's not right. You that's a precedent. No, it's not a precedent. Because up until that time, even when the king of the north and the king of the south were going against each other, you had three. There was somebody else. And as we went through those long verses, we would from time to time notice the ships, uh, the ships of Kittim. That referred to the naval armada of Rome stationed in Cyprus and how that they would intervene. And so there was really the precedent for three personages, three groups uh, in the past. So uh, my, my view is that you've got three, but you've got good men who say, no, it's only two. It's been a debating point amongst Bible students. But uh, the notes that I've given you, I, I, I press forward, I press strongly that there's three people involved. So you've got this king, this willful king, and there will be three things we will be looking at regarding him. The religion of the willful king, the warfare of the willful king, and if NATO and uh, 
the armed forces of the world, if they looked at this, they would learn an awful lot of what lies ahead in the future. These are the crucial key battles. They're succinctly stated. They're mentioned elsewhere in Scripture, but um, very, very important. These are war. This is warfare that lies just over the, just on the horizon. Very close. Very close. And then you've got the exaltation and the end of this willful king. A king shall do according to his end. You'll notice on page 200, 326, we've given you the pronouns in red. And uh, the other sections also, they're in red. And that means it's always the willful king. All the pronouns from now on to the end of chapter 11, refer to the willful king, not to the king of the north. The coming Antichrist is going to be willful. Uh, the time, uh, he will have time for, there will be no time for people voting. Uh, no uh, primaries, no polls, no... Uh, democracy, no congresses, no uh, parliaments, no cabinets, no advisors. He will step out onto the stage as the willful king. He will do according to his will. Other The will of others, all that matters is that they follow him. And that's it. That's it. Who is likened to the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse uh, 4 of Revelation 13. He is the willful king. And uh, so as we look at him, in verse 36, we see his self-exaltation. In verse 37, we see that there are no previous precedents for this king. Here we're starting with a blank piece of paper and we, we draw it out and it's something that's never been drawn out or conceived uh, on the face of the earth before. Never anything like it. We cannot imagine what this man is going to be like. Thankfully, we will not be here. We will be in heaven. But we've got these notes. These notes are going, will go on the website. The messages are on the website. Others get the notes out. And you've got YouTube today. You've got Good Studies and Daniel on YouTube. And uh, you can see, people can see that about this man who is going to, to come, to come. So no previous precedents. And then he's got a new kind of God. And even reading it. It's difficult to read it because the way it reads is is different. You're you're dealing with uncharted territory here. Uh, we've not seen anything like this. How it it doesn't totally make sense to us because we're dealing with something the world has never seen before. But to begin with, you've got his self exaltation. He magnifies himself above all religions. In verse 36, it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god. Now, one of the marks of false religion is a certain amount of pride. And false teachers, a certain amount of pride. Uh, uh, truth can be told that you have wheat and tares. In the uh, parable of the, the, the kingdom, wheat and tares. From a distance, they may both look alike, but uh, the uh, wheat tends to bow over. The tares stand more upright, more erect. The uh, wheat, you can pull away from the ground much easier. The tares, you have a hard time pulling up. They're really joined to the earth. The wheat's good to get leave the earth. I mean, we want to go to heaven. The tares don't want to go, and so, but uh, so you've got this 
uh, rather pride, one of the marks of false religion is it will be attended by pride. And so, but never on the scale of this man. This goes beyond. Uh, uh, again, he's a, a combination of gross materialism, of, of gross wickedness, unspeakable wickedness. In other words, in the Old Testament, idolatry under the forms of various forms of wickedness was a major, uh, that, that was embedded in the worship, but this man will, will do that very same thing. And a brutal militarism, uh, no one can make war with him. By the midpoint, he has the world under of the tribulation, he will have the world under his control. And he magnifies himself above every God. And then he blasphemes the true God in verse 37. And she'll speak marvelous things. Whoever marvelous in a bad sense, who would ever believe in your worst nightmare that somebody would say this? about the God of Israel, about Jehovah, about the Lord Jesus Christ, this man is going to reach heights of blasphemy. And that will be part of the world's worship during the tribulation. Oh, uh, who's, who's going to bring out another song of blasphemy? against the against the, the highest. And that's going to carry on. We cannot imagine. And you have that verse there in from Revelation chapter thirteen and verse six. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. Now others have done that all through the centuries. But now we reach levels that never more, never before conceived of. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. Christians are already, the rapture's already taken place. Uh, we're in heaven when he starts doing this. He won't do it until the midpoint of the tribulation. Uh, he, he, the mask, though, slips at the midpoint, although we will... People will see where he's going. And then he will be successful for a time. He shall prosper, verse 6, till the indignation be accomplished, for that uh, that is determined shall be done. His, uh, he, he will have success. Uh, it gets better and better for him. Nothing stops him. No hindrances. Every uh, form of opposition. The uh, those that are saved during the tribulation, if they're not martyred, uh, they'll go into hiding. Israel will flee into the wilderness. Uh, he will have no opposition at all. All broadcasting, all pronouncements are directed to him. But you'll notice. You'll notice that uh, it will be uh, until that is determined shall be done. It, it will have a he, you can you can be antichrist for a season, and then it all ends. And forty two months, whether you count it forty two months, you want to count by months, okay, or days, twelve hundred and sixty days, or time times half a time, three and a half years. Take your pick. That's all the longer it's going to last. And he has, and you, we can look over the last three and a half years. It's gone pretty quick. Uh, it goes very quick. And so, till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. We got that quotation there from Job 20 verses 4 and 5. Knowest thou not that, uh, this of old, since man was upon, uh, was placed upon the earth, that the triumphing of the wicked is short, and the joy of the hypocrite but for a moment. It doesn't last long, 
there's pleasure in sin, but it's for a season. And the man of sin, yeah, the season will not last long. Those who follow him, the, the ten horns who lend their support, it says they reign with him for years. No, it says for one hour. One hour. That's all. One hour. It's gone. That's it. That's it. And so, oh well, we, what a thing. And then, we come to this next point. Now we're entering a, a very strange, enigmatic uh, portrait uh, given of the Antichrist. And we're entering uh, some things that, among students of the Scripture, they have long debated. Uh, I have to take my positions. Others will have to take their positions. I guess when we get to heaven, we'll know... Uh, who was right, who was wrong, but I have to tell you what I think. And um, I've also considered what others think. And I, I take seriously what learned students of Bible prophecy think, and I have to say now, is that right or is that wrong? And you just have to look at this, because we're looking at some things now that uh, really are quite uh, enigmatic. Uh, the willful king will disregard his ancestors' faith. It says, neither shall he regard, uh, verse 37, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. Actually, it makes three statements here. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Now we can pretty well be a certain, we got three basic statements. The last statement we understand. Uh, neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women. By the way, they are all linked together. So the desire of women must have something to do with with religion. It must have something to do with it. Next week we're going to deal with that, and I think you're going to be shocked when I show you what I think it has to do with religion. And uh, But neither shall he regard the God of his fathers. We will look at that for just a minute uh, tonight uh, and, and, and take a many believe that this statement indicates that he will be Jewish. The God of his fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, that is, and again, uh, he is going to, and the argument is, and it's a good one, and it's valid up to a point, I think. Uh, he makes a covenant with Israel. He supports them on the Temple Mount. He lets them build a house of worship. Can you imagine such a thing in today's climate? He, um, uh, and as I said last week, I think he can do it because I think Israel, according to Psalm 83, will have already removed uh, the immediate threat on her borders. So it's a political expedient. It's not too difficult for him to do that. I think Israel will be stronger, uh, at least seem to be stronger, with regard to her immediate borders, and she is now. But he will go further, and he will give her, and you can imagine, my, he is a, a powerful man, because what would the United, what would happen today if somebody comes along and says, well, we will let Israel have a place of worship on the Temple Mount. What would that happen? Oh, the, the world would be in a fury. Now that's exactly what he's going to do, and he's going to do that. And he's going to let Israel have a place of worship. And he's going to let them reinstitute their Old Testament sacrifices. And because he does this, uh, many think, well, he probably is Jewish. And you link that to this passage. He will not regard the God of his fathers. And so you've got a good number of uh, sound Bible teaching 
that says he's Jewish. We won't know for certain. Um, and they will link it also to John chapter 5, verse 46. I am come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. If another will come in his own name, him you will receive. That doesn't really nail it down, but uh, it's pointed to. The point I would like to make here, the, the, the way the expression is usually used, it brings in Jehovah. Now here it says the Elohim of his fathers, but when it's usually stated, not always though, and the exception is there, but many times if there is an exception, the exception proves the rule. The general rule is that uh, it's the Lord God of his fathers that is usually used in the Old Testament. And you've got those passages there, and this is the usual phrase used, but at times... There is the other. And so usually it's Jehovah Elohim of their fathers. And Lord God, you'll notice in capital letters there, Lord, that's Jehovah. So that's the way it is usually used. Here it is not stated that way. Lord is the, Jehovah is the redemptive covenant name of Israel. And uh, so... Now, the question is an open one, but the simple fact that the Antichrist will hate the Jews, will try to obliterate at the midpoint every single Jewish person in the world, that they will have to flee, that will raise the question, would a, a Jewish person even do that? And so... Um, now, the God of their fathers can just as easily be, uh, was it, so that means the God of his father, that means he doesn't come from a secular background. He could come from a Roman Catholic background. He could come from a Greek Orthodox background. My, uh, my feeling has been he might come from a Greek Orthodox background, hence the the picture we've given you here does not regard the God of his fathers refer to the Greek Orthodox Church. And, uh, you know, I was uh, uh, talking to Edmar this morning, who's lived in Romania, and he, you know, he said everybody in Romania is, uh, they're Orthodox, and they're all religious, and they, and so the Orthodox faith tends to be a stronger faith in the countries that it's in. I, I don't think it's had the deterioration that Roman Catholicism has had. Certainly, when you get to the middle of the tribulation period, it is, it is pretty certain that, according to Revelation chapter 17, he destroys the Roman Catholic Church. And I have wondered if this man has an orthodox background, or at least his fathers, his family, and to regard the God of his fathers. And, of course, that was also a religion based on icons and imagery. But um, it could be. It could be. Uh, we give you on page 328, again, just a, a review of where the Antichrist came from, as, it, as it's given in Daniel, he comes from the ten, from among the ten horns, from Europe generally, from ten powerful nations in Europe. He's not from any of those ten nations, but he's from among them. We saw that. And then he will come from among four of the ten. We saw this. And that's the eastern part of the ten. The ten that uh, would rise out of Alexander the Great's empire, the eastern. Roman empire was divided between east and west, Latin speaking, Greek speaking. It seems likely, uh, reading Daniel 8, that he comes from the eastern side. 
But again, it doesn't say uh, he comes from one of the four. It says he comes from among one of the four. But he could easily have uh, at least his parentage, his ancestry could easily be orthodox. It could be. It could be. And then the third uh, narrowing focus here. The Antichrist is linked, linked to Titus and his armies which destroyed Jerusalem. I don't believe the modern view that the Antichrist is going to be a Muslim. I know many are teaching that. I think it's wrong. I think he will basically be European. Uh, but he is linked with Titus, the people of the prince that shall come. And we saw when we looked at those, uh, looked at Daniel chapter 9, that Titus, when he came against Jerusalem, came with five legions. But the legion that led was called the Macedonian Legion. And we saw that legion. And again, uh, the kind of uh, coming from the, the north uh, western side of the Greek Empire, of Alexander's Empire. And so that is uh, likely to be, my thought is, if it is possible to narrow down his, his uh, ancestry, his Provence, it is likely that he will come from the Greek side of things. And so, the hello, good to see you tonight. Great. Almost uh, coming to the end, but uh, nice to have you tonight. And so uh, that is probably probably the, the the point from whence he comes, and he will come, and he will come into the pleasant land, and uh, well next week. So tonight, who is the Antichrist? Where does he come from? Uh, what's the identity of him? He will not worship the God of his fathers. My view is. That is likely to not be Jewish. It will probably be either Catholic, but more likely it will be an Orthodox Eastern, uh, Eastern Roman Empire, Grecian background. Next week we come to that second enigmatic statement. He will not regard the desire of women. Now you can say all sorts of things twirl around in your mind. You say that. We're going to show you, though, how shocking it is, and we will look at that next week. And uh, really, it, it, and the stage is being set for that on an unprecedented level today. So we will look at that. Well, today it is either Christ, Antichrist, uh, either we're a believer or we're lost, uh, but the Christ is coming the rapture is imminent at any moment, and we will take up with this next week. So if you have notes you need to catch up with us on, we will be glad to provide these with us. With it. Let's, let's bow for prayer. Our Father, tonight again we're thankful. We're thankful for the sure word of prophecy, and, and Lord, that Thou hast revealed these things, and we can read them, and we can see how we're headed and again it as it shows us the shadows of evening are indeed stretching out and Lord the night is coming when no man can work and Lord so we're thankful that even now we can uh, be spreading thy word on the streets of London and help us Lord as we do that and other ways of, of reaching people but do bless again the hour is late and thou art coming and what a blessed hope we have and not looking for antichrist but looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior Jesus Christ and save from the wrath to come and because thou hast uh, because thou hast revealed these things for us, that thou hast indeed shown us that we will not have to go. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will keep thee from the hour of temptation. 
which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell on the earth. We're thankful for those blessed truths that were not appointed to wrath. Thou wilt come for us. And Lord, we're, we, we think though of what terrible times await the world and, and how, how unbelievable it is. But uh, help us as we continue to try to reach the lost. We pray this in Jesus' name for his sake. Amen.